This week, join me in Cambodia as I unravel the mystery of a civilization that for centuries most thought didn't exist. A place of rumor, myth, and legend. Hidden in the jungle for over 400 years, the discovery of Angkor Wat shocked the world. Its intricate majesty could only be the work of an advanced and sophisticated people. But where did they go? And why did they abandon all these temples to the jungle? To uncover the mystery of the lost Khmer Empire, I'll climb to the top of Cambodia's greatest temple, learn the secrets of Bokator, its newly rediscovered lethal martial art, and take to the air to track down the reasons why this civilization disappeared into the mist of time. Reminds me of the good old days, flying hornets. <laughs> We're digging for the truth and going to extremes to do it. Hi, I'm Hunter Ellis. I've come to Cambodia to explore the mysteries that still surround a great civilization that existed here over 800 years ago, the Khmer Empire. Its capital, called Angkor, is long gone. But the temples built by this powerful civilization are some of the wonders of the world today. That's what I want to see. The Khmer Empire dominated Southeast Asia from 800 to 1432 AD. At its peak, the empire stretched from Vietnam to the Bay of Bengal and north to southwestern China. But despite its wealth and power, the Khmer Empire ultimately failed, its land and temples abandoned. I'm here to find out why. For this assignment, there's only one place to start, and I'm told only one person to start with. His name is Simon Warwick. He's among the world's leading experts in historic stone masonry. I'm told he's a tough man to track down. He's an Englishman who lives in Italy, who works with the Germans, who spends a bulk of his time here in Cambodia. Now, he told me to meet him at his office. Well, this is his office. Let's go see if we can track him down. Angkor Wat, Cambodia's most famous temple, is actually a huge complex. Just when you think you're approaching the main temple, you find out that you're only passing through an elaborate gate on the outer wall. This place is absolutely amazing. As you approach the front gate, that's all you can see. But then it opens up to all of this, the main temple, which is still 400 yards away. I'm told that Angkor Wat literally translates to city temple, as it used to be surrounded by an urban landscape that has long since disappeared. Simon works for the GACP, a German conservation project. Its mission is to save this Cambodian jewel from the ravages of time, weather, and human contact. I'm hoping that Simon can help me understand how such a masterpiece could be built and then abandoned. Angkor Wat is, in fact, the world's largest religious monument. That statement alone grabs your attention, but to see it is to believe it. The path leading ever upwards is a demanding journey, with stairways connecting different terraces on different levels. Finally, the center of the temple. It looks like I still have to head up there. Originally, it was a priest who would come up these steps. And they're definitely meant to be steep because they represent the difficulty of getting into the kingdom of heaven. Simon! Hi. Hey, how are you? I'm all right, come on up. It's right through there? Through the door and I'll meet you at the bottom of the scaffolding, okay? All right. Can you imagine coming this way to work every day? Hey, Simon. Hi, great to see you. I covered some serious ground to make it up here to you. Oh yeah, but it was worth it. Oh, I cannot believe this is your office. Angkor Wat. The greatest religious monument in the world. The magnitude of this place is truly hard to grasp. Angkor Wat tops out at 213 feet, making it as high as Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. And it holds as much stone as the Great Pyramid of Khufu. And how long did all of this take? Well, that's what's so incredible. It only took 32 years to build. I think if we were to build something like this today, it would take us longer than 30 years. <laughs> no question. If you compare that with the buildings in Europe, like 
cathedrals, some of which are much smaller than this, they took three, four hundred years. So ten times the length of time it took to build all of this. Right, and there's a lot more stone here. You know, Simon tells me that it took 50,000 workers to build this extraordinary temple. It's surrounded by a four-mile moat and crowned by five huge towers. But size doesn't begin to measure the real power of Angkor Wat. Well, I've been coming here now since 1994. It's a long time. And you know, every time I come in, I see something new, something different. It's so varied, so complicated, so... Virtually every surface in this temple is covered with exquisite carvings. Surprisingly, these stories come from a faith that originated in India, far across the sea. Incredibly sophisticated, this carving. And they're telling stories from Hindu mythology up here. But how does the Hindu faith arrive in Southeast Asia? Because we're 2,000 miles away from India. Well, it turns out the answer lies in the monsoon winds that carried seafaring Indian traders to the Mekong Delta. Marooned for months before they could ride the monsoons home again, they traveled upriver, passing their religion, art, and architecture onto the local people. The religious community were trying to communicate with people who couldn't read. So they put these images and the stories on the wall so that the people could understand it. What are some of the stories that are being told? Well, this is, this is very interesting. This is an uh, image that you'll find on religious buildings around the world. It's the Last Judgment. Now, I noticed that some of these guys have their faces carved out or destroyed. Uh, this figure's particularly unpopular. He's the administrator who actually gives out the sentence. So he's the, the, the sort of prison guard who says, you're going to hell. It's not looking too pleasant down there. It's hell. There's 32 different types of hell as well. So is that a superstitious thing over the years that people have come in and destroyed the faces yeah. of the demons? That's the local people just saying, bad, bad, I don't like him, bad, bad. Simon tells me that these bas-relief carvings go on for more than half a mile. They're the longest continuous sculptures in the world. It's an awesome sight, but one that may not last. It starts and stops raining at a moment's notice around here, huh? Simon takes me on a precarious path to his current work site to show me the ongoing struggle to keep this civilization from disappearing again. So I just want to show you here, this is what happens if we get here too late. It's gone. Yeah, and when it's gone, all you've got is a rock. Here, we've lost the surface, we've just got geology. Here, we've got history. The carvings... The ravages of time have they're weakened lost. these carvings. So the history, they're now separating the from the foundation. How do you keep this from happening when it exists in an environment where it rains like this all the time? Actually, it rains some of the time, and the other time it's really, really hot and dry. So really the key word here is research. You've got to understand exactly why things are happening, and only then can you understand how to treat them properly. But when you have the biggest religious monument in the entire world, is your work ever going to be done? No chance. So what we've got to do is train the guys here to do it by themselves. I mean, this is their heritage. Their ancestors built it. They should be doing it. This is one of those places you never get tired of exploring, and that's good, because I still haven't cracked the core mystery. How did a people in the middle of the jungle build one of the greatest stone monuments on Earth? A few places on this planet inspire as much wonder as Cambodia's national treasure, Angkor Wat. But the more I see of it, the more questions I have. Not only did the ancient Khmer construct one of the largest stone buildings in the world, they did it without using any kind of mortar. How'd they pull that off? I'm hitting the road to find out. Just 20 miles northeast of Angkor Wat, I come to a place so important to the Khmer, they revered it as sacred. The majority of the Angkorian temples were built using a local sandstone. And huge blocks like this are all that remain of an old quarry that lies here at the foot of the Kulin Mountains. The sacred stone from the Kulin Mountains was used not only for the massive temple at Angkor Wat, but for literally hundreds of other Khmer temples across northern Cambodia. Imagine the manpower needed to cut blocks from these cliffs, drag them into place, and then build the astonishing temples we see today. How did they do it? It's essentially the same question that has puzzled Egyptologists for centuries. But in the case of the Khmer, we may have found a key that unlocks an important piece of this mystery. Angkor Archaeological Park includes about 70 ruins in an area that's roughly 80 square miles. 
Simon Warwick tells me that in one of these temples, there's an obscure but significant carving. Okay, this is the place that gives us a clue as to how the temple was built. Now, you see these guys up here? Yeah. They've got a horizontal beam with a lever hanging off it and then a block. And these guys are pushing the block backwards and forwards, rubbing it on the one below. It's fascinating that there's a clue right here. Would it be possible to build something similar to this to try out the method? Why not? Let's have a go. To test out how the Khmer made their stones fit together so perfectly, we're going to try and build a machine similar to the one we saw on the temple wall. Hey, Simon. Everything just as ordered. Everything we're right. working from a sketch are, based yeah. on the bas relief we saw earlier. Got all the beams. Our laboratory is a local masonry workshop where modern artisans make recreations of the temple carvings. The Cambodians who work here have never done anything like this, but they're curious and willing to help. It's basically a cross beam with a lever. That's right. This will hopefully allow us to lift more weight a lot yeah. more easily. Well, what it'll do is it'll take the weight off the top block so that it's easier to move it backwards and forwards. OK. We get right to the business of building the supports for the cross beam. But the 95 degree tropical heat makes everything a challenge. What's he say? He said, foreigner a bit slow. Do you need some help? <laughs> How do you say foreigner a bit hot? Barankdauna. Barankdauna, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't. Allow the master. My new Cambodian friends okay, generously lend me a hand. Other ones? With the supports up, we hoist the cross beam. Our project is starting to take shape. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah! We need to tie the framework nice and tight. It's going to support a lot of weight. All right. So there's 200 pounds at least, huh? <laughs> How do we move the stone? My head. <laughs> <laughs> now we're ready to muscle the first rock into position. Once the bottom rock is in place, we attach the lever. All right. Very well hung, as they say. <laughs> yes, this is very well hung. To make it easier to move the top block into position, we drill holes and insert pegs into the rock. Simon says this is exactly how the Angkorians did it. The side ones are for lifting, and the top ones will help us rub it backwards and forwards. OK. OK, but the important thing is that this enables us to lift it without having a rope underneath it. So by not having any ropes underneath, that's what would allow them to get the nice, smooth contact. In every civilization in the world, they've always found a system for lifting a block without having a rope underneath it. Because when you put a 10-ton blo block down on a building, you don't want to have to pull out the rope afterwards. Hey! Hey! Oh. 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 Woo. We just lifted 400 pounds. The big moment has come. We had a plan, we executed it, and it looks just like the diagram. Ready, guys? Up. Now let's see if it works. This feels really uneven. It doesn't. It's banging the corners. Simon's idea was to use a straight back and forth grinding motion to smooth the rocks. That doesn't work so well. So Shatri, the shop owner, suggests a new way to go. Now I'm definitely feeling more rubbing it's this feeling way. feeling more like it's grinding. Yeah, it feels more like it. It feels much more even and smooth. Well, yeah. It's an ancient version of sandpaper. <laughs> After five minutes of grinding, we're ready to see our handiwork. Take it off, Tree. Down, 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 down. Okay. We got a sandy mess there. What do you think's underneath? I think it's smooth. You do? Yeah, this yeah. this feels nice and smooth right here. Only two million more to go, and we could have our own temple. You really have to admire ingenuity like that and appreciate just how hard they had to work. When we return to the temples, I find myself noticing details I never saw the first time. You know, I'm starting to see these holes everywhere, and now I realize just how important they were to put this whole place together. Yeah, I mean, that's what's great about this. As you look around, you see more and more and more. So much to see. Simon takes me to see the two most exquisite
carvings at Angkor Wat. After our successful experiment, he says I can now appreciate why the Angkorians labored so hard to fit their blocks perfectly. Well, this place wasn't so much planned, carved, and assembled the way places are in Europe. This was planned, assembled, and then carved afterwards. So essentially, we're walking inside of one giant sculpture. Right, now have a look at this. This will give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Ah, this is beautiful. This, for me, is one of the most perfect pieces of carving in the temple. It's absolutely beautiful. And you can actually see the fine seams where they've assembled it right here. These are the joints. You see, she's not made of one single block. She's made of four different blocks. How difficult is it to carve multiple blocks stacked on top of each other? If these were just stacked together with a mortar joint, the way we do in Europe, you wouldn't be able to carve over it, because it would snap. The fact that they've made a perfect razor contact joint means that these two blocks act like one single block. And the pressure between these two blocks means that you can run your chisel over and you don't snap off the edge. And I imagine you probably only get one shot because it's already built. I can't imagine how scary it must have been to carve this. If you snap off that nose while you're carving, where do you go from there? And you probably got one less stone carver because I reckon the king would. <laughs> <laughs> What's more, Simon tells me that every little detail in the temple contributes to an overarching cosmic plan. The Khmer regarded their rulers as gods on earth, and this temple was built to represent the Hindu universe in miniature. Its towers symbolized Mount Meru, the celestial home of the gods, and its huge moat, the vast cosmic oceans. But here on Earth, their universe ultimately came crashing down. What went wrong? Angkor Wat, it may be the most beautiful religious monument ever built, and the most mystifying. Completed in 1145, the crown jewel of the Khmer Empire was inexplicably deserted two centuries later. The remote location and the relentless Cambodian jungle hid all the region's temples for over 400 years. They were the stuff of legend until 1860, when a French naturalist named Henri Mouot came upon them by accident. When his report hit Paris, these temples became all the rage across Europe, with people talking wildly about a new lost world. I imagine this is what it must have been like when Henri Mouot stumbled upon Angkor Wat. The jungle had reclaimed the stone temple. As you can see, the tree just digs its roots into any openings it can find and grasps onto the stone, creating a silent but deadly slow motion wrestling match. And given time, the tree always wins and destroys its host. It's brutal, yet beautiful. Muo and other early European explorers didn't believe that ancestors of the natives they met could have constructed these fantastic temples. They credited an unknown race of master builders, but they couldn't have been more wrong. To get a better sense of all the Khmer's accomplishments, I'm meeting up with Damien Evans, the deputy director of something called The Gap. Damien! Hunter, how's it going? Hey, good, how you doing? Good, mate. Come on up the stairs, this way. GAP All stands right, for the stairs. Greater Angkor Project, right. where archaeologists use sophisticated aerial imaging techniques to peer deeply into Cambodia's past. Uh, so this is the very first radar image of Angkor, uh, taken by NASA from a space shuttle in 1994. So I'm guessing that right here is the temple complex, right? That's right. Actually, uh, that little square in the middle there is Angkor Wat. Uh, so you can see it shows us for the first time that Angkor was absolutely huge. Next, Damien shows me a new image created by AirSAR, which stands for Airborne Synthetic Aperture Radar. Its longer wavelengths penetrate the forest canopy to expose much more than meets the eye. It shows us that Angkor was more than just a collection of temples. It shows us that it was a vast inhabited landscape which sprawled over more than a thousand square kilometers of this area. What is this reservoir right here? That one there is the West Barai. It's a reservoir that's eight kilometers long, two kilometers wide, designed to trap water coming down from the north during the dry season and distribute it throughout the south. 
and this can be quite This map reveals a remarkable new discovery. It's difficult to an extensive going. system That's of waterworks hidden for centuries in the Cambodian here. landscape. So in this map you can see much more clearly the detail and the sophistication of the water management system. You see dozens and dozens of canals. In fact, you can trace the flow of the water through this network uh, from this area here through this very complex system in the middle and then dispersed throughout Angkor to the south. This is great because down on the ground, you'd have no idea that any of this exists. Yeah, look, even archaeologists have trouble making sense of this landscape from the ground. Uh, what you really need to do is get up in the air and uh, have a look at things from an aerial perspective. Sounds like a great time for a little airborne reconnaissance. Damien and his colleagues have recently released a major new study. Turns out, Angkor Wat was just a small part of the largest settlement in the pre-industrial world. And arguably, the Khmer's greatest achievement was not their temples, but what they could do with water. So what we can see down here is the West Marai. This is the largest reservoir in the Khmer Empire and holds about 50 million cubic meters of water. Absolutely massive. How was this created? Did they dam up a certain part of it or was this all hand dug? A little bit of both, actually. The downslope side was probably a dam originally, and then they formalized it into making it a, a huge rectangular reservoir by mounding up earth all along the sides of it. So this was pure hard labor right here. Absolutely. Just like any task on the landscape here, it's completely flat, so any time you see something like this, it means that they've just poured thousands and thousands of people into remodeling the landscape in that area. I mean, when you think about 16 square kilometers of a reservoir in the 12th century, that's a huge engineering feat. The engineering here is unparalleled. You don't see it really anywhere else in the pre-industrial world on this kind of scale. Turning north, we fly over ancient rice paddies whose boundaries were set a thousand years ago. What we can see crisscrossing the landscape here is an incredible system of water management that really doesn't exist anywhere else in the ancient world on this kind of scale. Is that what this is right here in front of me? Right. This is actually the main feeder line of, of water from the headwaters where the rain falls in the Kulan Mountains to the north and transporting it right down into the central temple district. You know, archaeologists have always known about these huge temples. For at least 100, 150 years they've been well studied. What we've been able to do using remote sensing and using this uh, NASA radar imagery is to really come to terms with the scale and the complexity of this water management system. With Damien's help, I now see the landscape is full of clues to the past. It's amazing to consider the skills of these ancient Angkorians. When I first saw the temple of Angkor Wat, I was blown away. But I literally thought that that was all there is. But now I realize, after being up here in the air, that it's part of a greater civilization that goes on and on as far as the eye can see. It truly is very impressive. From the Kulin Mountains to the temples and rice fields below, this intricate scheme of 1,100 square miles of irrigation and reservoirs gave the Khmer year-round harvests. It made it possible to feed a population of up to a million people and brought its rulers vast wealth. From this perspective, we can clearly see how they mastered their environment and even catch a glimpse of a temple still shrouded in jungle foliage. And how many people have ever been to this temple, you think? Maybe half a dozen people, I think, would have been to this temple on the ground. And this area is littered with things like this. This is one of several hundred temples like this. So right now, we're heading up to the north of Angkor, towards the Kulan Mountains, which is the source of the water for the Siem Reap River, which feeds the central temple zone. What you're going to see up here is pretty impressive. Our pilot goes in for a close-up before landing us on top of the mountain. They're still actively clearing mines in these areas? Yeah, they are. It's very heavily mined in this area here. Well, I'll follow you then. Due to its strategic location, this area is riddled with landmines. Cambodia is still emerging from a nightmare, 30 years of war including the genocidal reign of the Khmer Rouge in the 1970s. But a fragile peace is now renewing the hope of the people here and allowing them to once again enjoy their birthright. Damien takes me to a sacred part of the river. Wow, look at this. 
it looks like they've actually carved out the stone of the riverbed here. That's right, yeah. In fact, all of this area here is carved out underneath the water. What are these symbols? Uh, well, the central object there is called a lingam. Uh, it's a phallic symbol, a symbol of male fertile power. Uh, the enclosure around that is called a yoni, which is a representation of female fertile power. Is this meant to give some sort of symbolic power to the water here? That's right. As the water flows over the top, it's uh, imbued with this kind of ritual fertility. Then it flows down from the Kulan out into the rice fields at Angkor down below and sort of delivers that fertile power to the rice fields. Damien tells me that these symbols would have been carved during the dry season when the riverbed is exposed. There are hundreds of these carvings engraved here. So, in a sense, they're blessing the source of the water that feeds their empire. That's exactly right. If I were to climb in and uh, touch the stone or drink from the water, would that give me strength and fertility? Uh, look, I don't know about that, but I'm pretty sure it would make you very sick, so you'd need all the help that you could get, I reckon. <laughs> now that I understand the spiritual importance of the water here, I want to get another look at that spectacular waterfall. These are just the smaller ones up yeah. here. It goes down, and like the bigger ones are down there. These are the headwaters of the Siem Reap River. It's called the Ganges of Cambodia, and now I know why. Like the Holy River in India, people come here to be renewed in both body and soul. It's not hard to believe it's a little bit of heaven. but you can't appreciate it until you're actually standing right under it. And this is the exact same power that fueled the Khmer Empire. It's absolutely amazing. Damien and I leave the mountain as we arrive by helicopter. Driving back into town, he explains how water and rice were the keys to the Khmer success. They have used the canals for agriculture. Traditionally, people have denied that that's the case, uh, but increasingly, what our mapping work and what our excavations are showing is that these canals were very tightly integrated into the rice agriculture system here at Angkor. Well, you would have needed a big army to build an empire that was that huge, and rice would be a cheap way to feed them. That's absolutely right. You know, if you manage water very effectively, you can also create huge surpluses and convert that directly into empire building. For centuries, the Khmer managed their water effectively, allowing them to feed their vast population and consolidate their power. They built a strong and wealthy empire, but their bond reliefs reveal another clue to their success. It's Cambodia's secret weapon, the lost and lethal martial art, Bokator. I've come to Northwest Cambodia in an attempt to solve one of the world's great riddles. How could a civilization that built this virtually disappear overnight? Their masterpiece lost to the jungle for over 400 years. Angkor Wat's rediscovery in the 19th century gave evidence once again that history is usually defined by those with the power. The ancient Khmer inscriptions found on many of these temples proclaim the greatness of the kings who built them but they tell us very little about the daily lives of the Khmer people. But it was, after all, the ancient Khmer people who built the rice fields, canals, reservoirs, and temples that distinguish this civilization. And it's their features that are reflected in the faces of Cambodians today. To learn more about the Khmer, past and present, I've come to the old market in downtown Siem Reap. We have the fish, vegetables, and it's all different kinds of fruit. Kin Po Tai is a cultural expert who grew up in this town. These are on the bar relief of the temple. So this this one is right been, here? Yeah, it's been preserved for thousands of years. It's simple, it's just salt it and dry out in the sun. Tai tells me that many things we see around us have changed surprisingly little in the last millennium. And the proof is carved in stone just a few miles down the road. So this is the second largest temple in Angkor, after the Angkor Wat, and it's the Bayon. It's the, one of the most famous temples as well in Angkor. Tai tells me that the Bayon is actually a Buddha shrine. It was built in the 12th century by a Khmer king who converted to this new faith when it swept through Southeast Asia. 
The Bayan is famous for the more than 200 giant faces atop its 54 stone towers and for its well, unique these wall carvings. carvings. These look a lot different than the ones over at Angkor Wat. Yes, because here's more about the everyday life of the people and the histories of war and way of life. It's like a window to its past. What do some of these things show us here? Uh, all here you see the market. This is a uh, lady selling fish. So we were at the old market today, but, th but this is the really old market, That's huh? correct. This is the old, old market. <laughs> is this some sort of gambling scene right here? Yes. It is cop fighting between the Chinese or the uh, Khmer here. So it's Khmer versus Chinese, Chinese cockfight, cockfight, and everyone's placing their bets. That's correct. My money's on the Khmer. And the Khmer. <laughs> <laughs> These stunning reliefs immortalize a civilization. The lady's giving birth here. From the wild boar fights to the construction of their temples. With the thousands of relief we have here at the Bayan, it seems like we have a very good idea of what life was like back in the 12th century. But are there any written accounts from outside the Khmer Empire that would corroborate all of this? Yes, there was only one written account, but not by the Khmer peoples who live here. It was written by Chiu Takwan, a great diplomat who arrived here in 1296, 1297, and he spent years living in the city here. So he experienced life here and wrote about it, and it matches what we see on the walls. That's correct. Sho Tao Kwan's journal of Khmer life at the end of the 13th century has been invaluable to historians. But many suspect that he was more than a diplomat, that he was in fact a spy. As an agent of his own powerful empire, Zhou casts a wary eye on his host's military capabilities, for good reason. Temple carvings at the Bayan clearly show that the Khmer were a ferociously warlike people. And now, with the help of animators at Monash University in Australia, we have the first historically based 3D simulation of the Khmer in combat. Here against their arch enemies, the Cham, who came out of what is now Vietnam. Behind every great empire is a great army. But this scene indicates that their success may have had less to do with superior tactics and weaponry than it did with the ferocity with which they fought, a Khmer character trait still very much on display. <laughs> this is typical of so many houses and stores here in Cambodia, as Pradal Saray, or kickboxing is their national sport. But we've uncovered a form of fighting that even these martial arts fans haven't heard of. It predates modern kickboxing and goes back to the time of the Angkorian warrior. Speaking of warriors, this is one dude you do not want to annoy. Adventure journalist Antonio Graceffo has literally fought his way around the world. But he came here to Cambodia to seek out the original martial art of Southeast Asia, the lost discipline of Bokator. I have fought eight countries in Asia, Europe, the States, and Bokator is by far the most interesting and most complete martial art I've ever seen in my life. But in an age when martial arts are so popular, why hasn't anybody heard of it? You know, it goes all the way back to the 11th century, but it almost died out twice. Once at the end of the Angkorian Empire, and then again during the Khmer Rouge period, they actually hunted down and killed all of the known masters. Antonio tells me that Bokator would have been lost forever were it not for the sacrifices of this man. 63-year-old Grandmaster Sean Kim San. How did the art resurface then? Well, the Grandmaster survived the Khmer Rouge period. He escaped to the States as a refugee. And then in 2002, he returned here to teach the art to children and to find the masters who had survived. You know, he only found 10 of them. Was he a hard guy to track down? It took me 18 months. It's a long time. Did you ever feel like giving up? No way, man. I was digging for the truth. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Uh, Why is Bokator the best martial art? I'm a believer, but what does that mean? <laughs> he said our Khmer Bokator is the best because we got so many techniques. We can use our elbows, we can use our fists, we can kick, we can knee, he can twist, he can bend, and he can kill. The Grand Master brought up 10 of his top students from Phnom Penh to our meeting place, a Buddhist monastery near Siem Reap. Yeah. 
It actually looks like it's an in close fighting technique that you need to be very close to your opponent in order to strike. That's right, that's right. Both two are unique in that they can fight very close to the elbows, knees, and then also grapple when they come in close. Looks, uh, when executed properly, to be pretty vicious. <laughs> it is, it is. After they finish group training, the master works with his two top students so I can see his moves up close. Yeah, using that elbow right against the throat there, huh? That's pretty much his signature movement is that quick elbow strike. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's all quick and body control, huh? Oh, oh. oh did he just rip his trachea? He ripped out his trachea. Simple head twist. I could feel that one from here. Oh, just spinning that head around. That's the Linda Blair. <laughs> the exorcist move, huh? Can't do this at home. Yeah. He said he wants to show you the Khmer short stick fighting. So you want to try some? Yeah, let's uh, walk before we run. We'll, we'll put the sticks on hold and let's start with some elbow moves. Maybe we'll start by crawling. Okay. <laughs> take it easy on me. Oh, I'll take it easy. I like you. Here comes the black belt. Okay, punch. Okay, so I can block you. Okay. And I can come in with my elbow here. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. And I would let go. You would let go. And they come down and. <laughs> <laughs> As you observed before, there's a lot of techniques we're going to control. Yeah. We're going to bring them into a knee or into an elbow yeah. or whatever. Because okay. when you do that, I mean, just the, just the way the you, weight. Yeah. yeah, the way you have control. I mean, there's not much I can do to, to and, fight it. And it's painful. If I were to come in here like this and yeah. try and grab you that way, yeah. How would you defend against? What would you? I do? Yeah. I'd probably hit one. Oh. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so a lot of this is predicated on your attacker coming in and kind of throwing blows. But That's what right. if, what if I were to? Kind of just be charging at you like a bull. Be like fighting my sister. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, so. <laughs> I hope you like your sister. <laughs> In their demonstration of Bokator, these modern day Khmer warriors give me plenty of evidence why their ancestors were so successful in building and defending their empire. But even these skills didn't save them from their fate. Despite all their power, wealth, and knowledge, the Khmer Empire ultimately failed. The city and its temples were abandoned, and the jungle swallowed all that was left. But what were the forces that led to the downfall of the Angkorians? And is it a cautionary tale for us? In my quest to understand the legendary Khmer Empire, I've plumbed the mysteries of her overgrown temples and deciphered how they were constructed by building a stone grinding machine based on a long, unnoticed clue. From the air, I cracked the watery matrix that was their secret to extraordinary wealth, and I experienced firsthand the power of both her sacred river and her lost martial art. The Khmer created a dazzling kingdom that dominated Southeast Asia. And yet, in the 15th century, their civilization collapsed. Their city and temples were abandoned to the grip of the jungle. Like in any great murder mystery, the list of suspects here is long. By the 1400s, it includes marauding invaders, a rebellious and disgruntled labor force, shifting state religion based on which king was in power, and internal struggles between the king and powerful Khmer families. To find out the number one reason why the Khmer Empire met its end, I've arranged to meet up again with Damien Evans, the deputy director of the Greater Anchor Project. All right, so I have a few questions for you. Sure, fire away. Well, I'm completely impressed with how sophisticated the Khmer Empire was. But what happened? How did they disappear? Well, the thing that you have to remember is that in the collapse of civilizations, there's rarely just one factor that you can point the finger at. Usually there's a range of different things going on. In the case of Angkor, what our work is showing is that the water management system was a critical factor in the decline. Really? So the same thing that made them so great also led to their demise? That's right. 
The water management system started off very simple and then over the centuries became more and more complex and difficult to maintain and this in turn caused problems for the fundamental basis of their economy, which was rice agriculture. According to Damien, one thing led to another. Overplanting of rice fields led to deforestation, which led to soil erosion, which caused huge amounts of debris and sediment to rush downstream, blocking up the canals and reservoirs. Breaching and flooding broke down the entire man-made watershed. The result? Famine in a city of as many as a million people. Hey, uh. All right. That looks like a great way to cool off. Yeah, the water actually comes from this Yemri River way down here. Now, is this water wheel something that you guys built yourself? No, I'm not exactly sure who built this, but uh, in any case, it's just a hypothetical reconstruction of technology that they may have used during the Angkor period to move water from very low places up to much higher ground. It's important to remember that this is not a natural river. Okay? This is an artificial canal which was built by the Khmer people. So this is one of those canals we saw from the helicopter. Exactly, yeah. This is uh, the big one that we saw from the helicopter yesterday. Um, the important thing about this side is, is it shows us the difference between the water level uh, of the river way down there and uh, the original level way up there where we got out of the Jeep. As the water receded, ancient technology like this could not have kept pace with the needs of the Khmer. As you can see, not a huge amount of water actually comes out of this. These little tubes and the water that they contain obviously wouldn't have been enough to fill rice fields or the moats of temples like Angkor Wat on a regular basis. So what we're seeing is a drastic change in the canal structure over time. Exactly, yeah. I mean, this is just uh, a very clear example of uh, a river down cutting. Uh, and if you, uh, you know, you have the water down there and the rice fields and the moats that you need to feed the water into are way up there, then obviously you're going to end up in deep trouble. This is uh, just one example of it here, uh, but the, probably the clearest example of it is uh, just up the river a little bit. We should go take a look. Okay. Yeah. To see hard evidence of what brought down the Khmer, Damien and I jump in a boat. Ah, it's amazing to think that all of these canals are man-made. Yeah, it's actually difficult to imagine it when you're down here on the river. You know, once you get up there in the air, you can really see that uh, far from being a sort of natural course, it's actually laid out in a very particular kind of way for a very particular kind of purpose. Damien points out that this hill represents the difference between what the water level of the river once was and what it is today. So what do we have here? Believe it or not, this is actually a bridge. These are its arches right here. Would this then be the bridge for the canal that we just came up from? Exactly. A thousand years ago, the water would have run uh, straight down through here and passed beneath these arches onto the other side. So we're standing on the original bed of the canal. That's right. Increasingly, as the years went on, the water level cut down into the landscape and just basically ended up going around this bridge, meaning it was completely ineffective. This is a drastic change. Yeah. Is this happening all across the empire? It is. The thing is, when you start to get unpredictable water flows, things like flooding too much or too little water, which starts to cause this uh, down cutting uh, and these diversions in the rivers, then all of a sudden you end up with extremely serious problems. Is it fair to conclude from all of this that the Khmer could have over-engineered their empire? I think with the evidence that's coming to hand now from excavations and from the aerial surveys, uh, I think it really supports that conclusion. Uh, so I think what you're saying is uh, probably a fair assessment of what actually happened here. The widespread failure of the Khmer's complex water system also left them vulnerable to attack. Their enemy to the north, the Siamese, successfully sacked Angkor in 1431. A year later, the royal court and Khmer people abandoned this site, moving south to where Cambodia's capital of Phnom Penh is today. For 600 remarkable years, these temples were added to and adorned. With their abandonment in the mid-15th century, however, one of the world's greatest building programs came to an end. But unlike other lost civilizations that have succumbed to the jungle, the Khmer's greatest temple, Angkor Wat, held on, with the help of a very special group of people. The truth is, this place was never fully abandoned. After Buddhism was adopted as a state religion, this site became a place of pilgrimage. After the last Khmer king left, the monks stayed and arduously worked to keep the forest from swallowing this great temple. And it's through their four centuries of effort that Angkor Wat is still here today. For many, 
Angkor Wat evokes a romantic tale of a 19th century explorer stumbling upon a lost civilization. But I came here to plumb the deeper mystery, to finally understand the real story behind the rise and fall of an amazing empire. Today, the Cambodians are so proud of their legacy, they're the only country to adorn their national flag with an image of a ruin. Angkor Wat, the ultimate symbol of majesty and mystery.